there, and welcome to Star Wars Music Minute, where we celebrate the music and sound of Star Wars five cinematic minutes at a time. I'm Chrysanthi Tan, you can call me Xanthi, and today we're talking about the soundscape contained within minutes 101 through 105 of Star Wars Episode 4, A New Hope, the motion picture. This is a really unique portion of the film. Out of all of the set of minutes in this entire film, this is the one with the least music. There's almost no music in this whole five minutes, except for at the very, very, very end, because during this five minutes, we are getting the rebel briefing and the send off before the trench run or the attack on the, you know, the Battle of Yavin, that whole thing. You know, we know Star Wars. Um, joining me today is Alex Cunningham, and we're going to talk about this really unique, this really unique scene from Star Wars that I love so much. Hello, Alex. <laughs> Hi, Zanthi. How are you? I'm great. I'm, I have been developing such an appreciation for this whole scene and also this whole like planet or, or moon um, of Yavin. How do you mm. feel about it? Uh, this is the scene where I know like Pete the Retailer goes to the bathroom when he, when he watches this movie really? like, at this time. Um, yeah, I was listening to the old Star Wars uh, Star Wars Minute uh, minutes for this. And and that's like the first thing he says, is, like there's a five minute stretch here that uh, where I just I can get up and go to the bathroom because it's just it's just talking. And um, I mean, that says oh. that says a lot about the interesting soundscape here and maybe the the uh, the subconscious or conscious effects of, of the music or lack thereof. But um I, I love it. It's, it's the calm before the storm. Um, and you actually answered just now one of the questions that I had about this moment. It's like, is this the longest stretch we go without a uh, score? And, and it sounds like it sounds like it, it is. is. It makes mm -hmm. me wonder if it's the longest stretch we go without score in in all 11 films. Um, Interesting. It, would, it wouldn't surprise me if it was, though. It's it's really got that late 70s, uh, I would say, courage to just, you know, let you absorb a little information, let you uh, absorb these character moments um, in their, like, authentic, I mean, highly constructed, but authentic feeling uh, soundscapes. Um, it's hard to it's hard to go that long without John Williams, but, um, but I think it's worth it, yeah. I love it. Um, I am a big fan of silence in movies, Although I have the kind of brain where if there's music playing, I'm not paying attention to plot. Like I can only play, pay attention to, I can't pay, I can't focus on one at a time, on both at the same time. So if I'm going to feel in the moment of this briefing and this, honestly, this reminds me of sort of being like in the green room before going on stage. It reminds me of being like just those like last minute plans and preparations and kind of nerves and like wishing everyone good luck before the big battle or the big like performance like that's what this reminds me of and it's so um like I so appreciate there being no music during this because it really is like it feels like how it feels like when you're backstage and everything is like a lot more awkward than you would expect and also like people are kind of giddy and, and bring out like new energy to things like it's hard to explain but backstage I don't know just like kind of a more heightened side of me and and of other people can come out you know oh i really appreciate you saying that i hadn't thought of it that way but it it immediately takes me back to um i i have a couple of times through basically dumb luck been able to be voice of god at a couple of concerts at carnegie hall and uh like telling everyone I to remember, go to their seats and stuff uh, yeah yeah and like introducing <laughs> the next act, next act and stuff like that um uh, and we, we, were, we were talking right before the show about the distracting moment when you hear your own echo. I mean, the, the, the main the main room in Carnegie Hall, incredibly distracting to hear yourself talking um, there. But um, I remember a few times where I, I wish somebody good luck right before they went out on stage. And and, you know, you're in that backstage spirit and thinking, like, go get them, you know, break a leg. <laughs> um, but instead of, you know, uh, instead of break a leg, which is what I was supposed to say, I said, good luck. And it, looked at me and they said, you think I need luck? And then the curtain opened and it was too late and I had broken their <laughs> spirit uh, by saying something nice. And that's, you know, that's when Hans, um, may the force be with you, which when I, when I listened to this uh, chunk of minutes without the visual sounded it's so genuine and heartfelt and his, you know, his voice dips half an octave or something. And he really gets that, that Harrison Ford just, 
you know, sincerity with a little bit of sweetness to it. Uh, and Luke looks at him like, it's like it's completely the opposite. Like it's totally disingenuous. You know, Luke just completely uh, seems to misread um, what what Han's intention is, or or he's just he's just got pre battle nerves. Pre fight nerves are it, it's a real thing, and it's a, that same what you're describing that backstage rehearsal nerves. Yeah, because there's they go like Luke goes through a lot of ups and downs like in this set of minutes. Like first he's like folk he's focused on you know the on the briefing. And having some side conversation about like bullseyeing womp rats. And then he's getting ready for the, you know, with his X Wing, he's sort of, we see that he has an apparent attachment to R2, which, you know, just in his line where he's like, not on your life, you know, when he's asked if he wants a new droid, um, you know, he's like, not on your life. That little droid and I have been through a lot together. You okay, R2? And we, it, it kind of shows us that, oh, that he, he's having like, he has feelings for his droid or like he feels attached uh -huh. to to his droid. And then we see that like he's he's still sad about Obi-Wan. He like wishes that Ben were here and he feels disappointed about his friend Han not joining and, you know, is kind of down about that. Has a little interchange exchange with Leia about how Han needs to do his own thing and whatever. And then he's kind of like, I don't know, he kind of has an interaction with Han. Um, and then he also has an interaction with Biggs, his old friend from home. And then it's like there are so many different, like each of these interactions has a different mood to it. Mm -hmm. And the one that finally sobers him up is, um, you know, that the, the coach leaning into him right before he goes out on the field of, of Obi-Wan's voice there at the end. Um, and yeah. that's that's the only one he doesn't seem to have a big emotional swing. Um, that's over. true. And that's that, 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 that little drop of wisdom there. Yeah, it's kind of perfect how this set of minutes ends with Obi-Wan's voice says, Luke, the force will be with you. <laughs> and that's the final thing we hear, or, except for this, you know, the very, very, you know, first bar of music uh, of the Battle of Yavin. But yeah. I'm, I'm curious how, how you took that, the, that the force will be with you from Obi-Wan there. there. There's a part of me, um, as someone who was born in 82 and, and watched the, um, my my father tells me he took me to Return of the Jedi in the theaters as like a one and a half year old. I don't know. Wow. I don't know if that was really what really what happened, but um, uh, you know, <laughs> sort of being an, an original trilogy kid for so long, I, my brain just the first time watching through these minutes on their own again, put the always in at the end of that line. Uh, and oh. it, it, it not being that because I'm so used to that more that more iconic moment of of Obi Wan telling him that the Force will be with him always. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if that's, is that my having this, uh, childhood ob obsession with that particular voiceover line? Um, you know, did you, did you read that and not automatically fill in, in the blank like I did? I didn't. I think I, because, because the force will be with you always is also a part. It's also something that I know, but, mm -hmm. um, maybe I take all of Obi-Wan's lines for granted, just how many of them there are. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, it's another one. There, there sure is a lot of voiceover in this. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, really, Ben has been talking to Luke ever since he died. Like, mm -hmm. right after, pretty much, he was already, you know, run, Luke, run. Like, he was already mm -hmm. coaching him from afar. Yeah, it's it, just on a story level. It's it's interesting to see Luke wishing he was there so badly. While, while as you point out, he's, he's he's still there. He's been there pretty often, actually, for a dead guy. I think Luke is maybe questioning whether he's hearing him, though. You know, mm. like we know that Obi Wan is a Force ghost. We know that he's <laughs> here, but Luke is sort of like, "Am I hallucinating?" Like what mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. he's still kind of questioning that voice later on when luke becomes stronger in the force and you know more confident in it um i think he trusts the voices that he hears and of course well all of that of course in return of the jedi when he like sees them and is talking to <laughs> right. obi-wan and yoda that's a whole different level but at this point i think everything he's questioning everything he's not trust 
he's not really trusting in it until really the end of the Battle of Yavin. So do you read that as, uh, as a topic that's come up a number of other times on other episodes of Star Wars Music Minute, but um, as, as diegetic or non-diegetic in that way? Like, like is this is that voiceover of, of Obi-Wan more for the audience's benefit or is it um, you know, a literal thing that Luke is experiencing and, and yet, I mean, if I heard Alec Guinness suddenly talking to me, I think I, I, think I would have like a, a more surprised reaction. I guess that's what makes me wonder, like how, where on the spectrum of, of diegesis uh, that voiceover I think, is. I think it's definitely something that Luke hears. So, I think it's definitely. I mean, I, it's definitely diegetic in my mind. Hmm. Yeah, like Luke, because we see Luke even kind of look around. Like he taps his headset here at the end. He's like, mm-hmm, huh? Mm-hmm. Almost like, am I hearing something in my headset? And uh, and then later on when he does, you know, trust in the force, turn off his computer, you know, in, in a few weeks. Um, I think that is also directly in response to Obi-Wan. But either way, like we do, since we do see the way that he actually physically sees Obi-Wan and is having like a pretty normal conversation with them, with him and Yoda in Return of the Jedi, I think, I think um, it's easier to draw a through line between like this being the seed that blooms into the future of like just accepting force ghosts Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i i keep wanting to get shakespearean here and think about like uh macbeth with the (sighs) dagger uh in in act two scene two uh where he's not sure if he's hallucinating it and then by the end he's totally fine with like ghosts coming out of cauldrons i totally forgot about macbeth but um yeah Actually, I remember in Eng- being in English class and being like talking in class about, is he really seeing that? Like, is this in his head or is, mm-hmm. or does he really seeing? The- yeah. Um, so <laughs> we're in the war room and we uh, this line, an analysis of the plans <laughs> provided by Princess Leah is so <sighs> distinct. It's so distinct in my mind. I don't even, like, the way that this briefing starts with that and then the beeps of the computer is just, um, I don't know, iconic? I mean, it's just, uh, like, there's no music here, but the the sound of the dialogue is the music. Yeah, I mean, I think if you played that that series of boops and beeps without any dialogue, I would, I would know exactly what we were talking about. It, it, would, it would transport me right there. Yeah, let's listen to a little bit of it. Nope. (laughs) Let's listen to a little bit of it. (laughs) An analysis of the plans provided by Princess Leah has demonstrated a weakness in the battle station. The approach will not be easy. You're required to maneuver straight down this trench and skim the surface to this point. The target area is only two meters wide. It's a small thermal exhaust port right below the main port. The shaft leads directly to the reactor system. Seeing all that hustle bustle. will start a chain reaction which should destroy the station. Only a precise hit will set up a chain reaction. I love how, like, I can see the visual when he says a precise hit will start a chain reaction where it's like all of the little bloops, like Mm -hmm. (laughs) all the little dots are going down. And then the way it where, beeps. Where boops turn to tone. Yeah. Um, and then you can hear the disbelief. Like, everyone, you know, like, that seems impossible. I mean, they're not saying that, but we can hear the chatter of everyone in the room. Mm-hmm. Oh, and then Wedge mm-hmm. says that's impossible. So there you go. Um, <laughs> I, I appreciate how mechanical it sounds. You know, it sounds like a... Um, it sounds less like a computer graphic or a presentation and, and more like a, a Geiger counter or something like that. It does. It does sound like a Geiger counter. Which I to me makes it feel more it, like even more like like an, an alarm or, you know, like it's more of a, a, a more serious issue here. Like they're, they're measuring something important. Yeah. I don't know if it feels like an al- alarm to me. 
it feels like something, it feels like a Geiger counter, basically, like you said, like it feels like it's something reacting to an actual physical environment or physical condition. If that makes sense, you know, like, Mm -hmm. um, or like a metal detector or something. Um, like there's, it feels physical. It feels very physical. It feels, um, really tangible, like a game. I mean, it, it kind of feels like a game really. You've, you've talked about in previous stars music minute episodes, the way that, um, folks who really play the video games a lot are, are super attuned to that kind of thing. And I, I haven't played any of the star Wars games like battle battlefront or any, any of those where you, you know, a split second decision is based on some audio cue, but, um, it wouldn't surprise me if this was, this was a, a sound cue that was absolutely like reproduced in some, you know, in some way in one of those games. Ah, oh, I bet I, I'm, I'm curious actually now. But I think just you know, that's something for the other listeners can can yeah. write in and, and tell us. Yeah. Uh, although I think it also just feels like really any type of game or not any type of game, like at least the types of games I see in my limited game knowledge, um, like the kinds of games that I have played, <laughs> the ones that are very easy and just have very simple like rules that or that you just react to like a lot of things happening and little bloops and stuff like that. I don't know. Those are the kind of games that I like. Um, Bloops games. Everyone. Bloops games. Yeah. yeah. The kind of games with bloops. Um, So yeah, that's, that happens. And uh, it looks so, uh, it looks, it looks very seventies. I mean, I've been thinking, thinking a lot lately since galactic star cruiser as of recording this, it's pretty new, Um, which is this hotel that, is this new like i don't know disney star wars hotel experience mm-hmm. and part of the experience is this game gameplay really or where you're like kind of on this ship which is the hotel and you are role playing kind of like mm-hmm. and it uh, like attacking stuff and it's very gameplay like also galaxy's edge is just like this too galaxy's edge in disneyland we're like on Smuggler's Run, which is the Millennium Falcon ride, you have each person has a role and you like are pressing buttons or like do controlling things and, you know, quote unquote, flying the ship and repairing the ship while you're on the ride. Um, and so I, the point is like, I've been seeing a lot of interfaces in people's YouTube videos. Like I've, I've been seeing what it looks like at the Galactic Star Cruiser Hotel. Um, what the what the designs of like the consoles look like and the computers and, and everything. Um, and I don't really know where I was, where I was going with this, but like, it just makes me really, it makes me pay attention to how quote unquote dated things may look. Um, yeah. But there's, there's also a simplicity to that design. I think it's the sound as well as the visuals that like, a, a thing that's roughly circular is going to go blows blowed, you know? And like, so you have some, some lines coming out of the middle of it and a line going down to follow the, uh, follow the proton torpedo. Uh, and, and similarly with the sound, you know, that, 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 um, increasing rate until, until the beeps become a tone, um, that, that translates really easily. You know, it's, it's not so complex that, um, that you need to worry too much about where, where the person's coming from. They're going to get this, this increasing tension until, the tension overflows. I think that's a really good point because like music is subjective in so many ways, but I like to always separate out what is subjective and also what is objective about it. Um, because I don't think it really helps to just say like all of it is made up and all of it is subjective. Um, like sure the way that we interpret it and frame it is subjective, but Mm -hmm. there are certain physical properties and there are certain things that are like actual I guess I don't think facts is the right word but um there are actual things that are more grounded in reality I would say or like immutable Mm -hmm. conditions and one of them being that like tension will result in like a higher rate of something something or you know whether it's like higher tension on a string will result in like a higher pitch or something and that and just you know, we could draw a connection between like higher tension in other, you know, like in your, I don't know, heart or not in your heart. What am I talking about? I don't know. I'm thinking about hypertension <laughs> now, <laughs> but like, um, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, 
I'm I'm at best a passionate amateur with like a lot of college singing training, which is to say barely a musician in the slightest. But so I, I recognize I'm talking to someone who uh, knows a lot, a lot more about this stuff than I do. But I'm wondering if you're talking about the ways that like rhythm is in some to some extent connected to to human heartbeats. And as long as the audience is a human with a beating heart, there are going to be certain rhythmic rhythmic effects that are somewhat common. And, you know, because humans, when they get really tense or excited, their heart rate goes up. So an increase, you know, a really high frequency rhythm is going to be correlated with high excitement or or tension or something, something sort of like almost something physiological. Like that. Yeah, something like that. And I think like even if we stripped away um, subjective terms like like stress or I don't know, happiness or sadness or like excitement or whatever, even if we stripped away those terms and just thought about like the physiological changes, um, I think that would still, I think there would be a lot more that would translate without like, you know, putting the baggage of, of what that means. Have you read this book called, um, nope, I don't remember the name of the book. All right. It's something about, <laughs> emotions <laughs> wow i just described like a million books <laughs> oh yeah the one, the one about emotions no i got you the one about how emotions are it's by someone named lisa something i it's like about how emotions are made up in our minds <laughs> um how emotions are like complete how emotions are made i think it might be called Okay. Lisa Feldman Barrett. That's it. Lisa Feldman Barrett. How emotions are made. The secret life of the brain, I think. Anyway, um, this, not everyone agrees with this. So I'm not trying to like, I'm not trying to push this research, research but it did, it did, it did speak to me personally um, mm -hmm. as someone who f will feel things, but not necessarily know what like emotion word is is happening or not even really know how I feel and um but if I learn what emotions people around me are feeling or like like I can be enculturated <laughs> I don't know if that's a word to recognize certain emotions and like it might even be that like I don't even know what regret feels like until I experience a lot of other people expressing regret and then I kind of learn about regret and then start start to incorporate that into my life basically mm -hmm. it's saying that like people universally can feel like things like good pain or like wanting something uh, or just or something or, or like disgust uh -huh. or something and culturally um the words even that cultures use to describe certain emotions or like just the way that we frame that different cultures frame certain uh, like physiological reactions uh, shapes how we consider our own em emotions. Mm -hmm. Like a baby might fall and scrape their knee and just, you know, cry because feel bad. They feel, feels bad and <laughs> like but if their parent is like scared and starts freaking out like really scared then the the baby might learn to be scared when that happens where they might yeah not there's, have there's an acculturation there for sure uh and there, there's i mean I, what, what i would connect to that and we have ranged so far off of poor general jan Dadana, but no I, though because i, I think that's I how think that's, a segue because it's how people it's how people respond differently to music too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But it, it, what it makes me think of from, from my own day job is occasionally I use one of those uh, wheels of emotions where there's like all these different words in a, in a circle sort of just to describe different possible emotions that someone can be feeling. And when, um, when I'm talking to someone who, who needs it sometimes, even as flawed as those tools are, um, it can be helpful for them to say like, well, it's not quite, it's not quite disgust and it's not quite annoyance and it's maybe it's closer to frustration and then they can kind of zero in on what they're feeling and just by naming it, even with all their cultural baggage that, that may be attended there, um, uh, they, they get, get a little more mastery over it and a little more self-understanding. Yeah. And I think, I think having like something like a, a wheel or like a big set of options 
can help, especially if it's a really big set of options. Um, because I think being in certain, being in particular circles or like in insular communities or even like amongst, if you know, only talking to music scholars or only talking to like your own group of friends or something, it, when everyone starts to use the same set of like five words to describe music, that kind of ends up being how we frame the music that is coming into our heads, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah. If I was going to touch that back to uh, Please. Uh, poor General Dodonna, um, <laughs> I was thinking about the, the what felt to me like such a universal um, and, and great uh, sound design of, of those simple beeps uh, turning into tone. And then within Dodonna's um, just vocal work, how many, what, what to me read is like, really subtle, subtle um, culturally relevant things are happening. Like uh, his, you know, what immediately came to me, and I, I, don't, I don't think this was intentional necessarily, but uh, his like microaggression to Princess Leia by calling her Leah. Um, I, ha I have oh, a, did a you think of that? I have a, I, I, that's, that was like how it immediately registered. And I don't think that's actually really what, what's, what's meant there. Um, though I kind of like, uh, some part of me is really interested in the idea that there's more office drama happening behind the scenes than than I'm aware of, um, but uh, but oh, like the Leia Leah and um, the way his accent is this to me very Star Warsian um, blend of uh, American and and sort of generic RP British um, British or English um, and you know kind of slips between them back and forth just like almost uh, like Leia. Like yeah, like Leia and and like uh, Vader. <clears throat> oh yeah. Um. Uh, and you know maybe that's maybe that's what the basic the basic accent for people of a certain level of education in in Star Wars is this uh, almost like nineteen thirties American. Um, you know, we used to be called a mid Atlantic type of accent. Oh yeah. Okay. I'm thinking of like uh, Judy Garland as a an example of that. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. The movie I'm, Christmas in Connecticut to me always comes up as a great example of of, of that kind of real real blend of, of people from all from New York City and all talk totally differently except all of the people of a, all the rich white people talk this same this one same way. I'm really fascinated with accents in Star Wars and I've been thinking about it a lot, especially with like the new stuff coming out. Um, so, what you are talking about. RP, of course, received pronunciation, which is like the mm -hmm. queen, the way the queen speaks, basically, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I can't do the accent, but just imagine like Tarkin. Yeah, exactly. It's Graham, it's Graham Moff Tarkin. Yeah. And it's like the fancy British. <laughs> it's, the, it's the royalty. It's the way that royalty speak. So that is something, um, at least in the original trilogy, that we associate with a lot of the Imperials. Right, especially the high ranking. Mm -hmm. Um, and then And Dodonna is a former Imperial military figure, I think, right? I should remember this from some from everything, but um I guess the assumption is that the rebels are all I mean, for the most part, anyone who's of Dodonna's age and is in the rebellion probably got to have his training as part of the Empire. True. Or the Galactic Republic. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. The Republic for sure. Like a lot of these people are. Um because also what I'm I'm trying to think of now, um, Bail Organa. No, he doesn't. Okay. Well, anyway, it doesn't matter. But in general, like the RP pronunciation in in Star Wars, I believe is called like the Coruscanti accent. Okay. And so that's kind of how I'm pretty sure that's how they uh, not justify it, but like keep it consistent because it there are a lot of cultural translation things that happen you know when you bring real life into star wars and mm -hmm. sometimes maintaining them can serve a purpose like if we're talking about the original trilogy and i'm specifying like original trilogy maybe prequels too just because there has been a lot more accent uh change up lately so oh, yeah. Yeah. i so i don't know how to categorize that yet but um there definitely is something to the fact that like fancy British people accent, fancy RP equals empire equals like Tarkin equals like Coruscanti, like elite. Mm -hmm. And 
Star Wars is such like a Rebels win type of, you know, type of movie, type of story that it the parallel kind of is like British Empire and, you know, versus like the common people and with, with, with you know, us siding on the side of the common people and, you know, the rebels mm-hmm. and everything. Mm-hmm. So having um, people like, I like this, I, I love the sequel films, but having people like, having so many people like, Ray and even like, I don't know, pretty much every, I feel like pretty much so many of those like white female leads in the mm-hmm. newer have that also, mm-hmm. or not even, not even just, not even just, just so many leads now have that are do an RP like accent as well. That used to be associated with the, you know, elite Coruscanti, um, whatever, Imperials. <laughs> monarchy type mm-hmm. of people so now uh that's the lines are are, are more blurred but and, um, and dodona has got this weird this weird blend that you get i, I mean for, for me again it feels it feels extremely star wars and and then like star wars episode four new hope star wars um that it, you you get that S- some words are, are textbook rp and some are just sound like he's in a regular old american I also don't know how much of that is an effect of, of the seventies. Um, well, the seventies, and also of um, the actor who playing Dodonna, whose name I am forgetting right now, um, but uh, being dubbed. Right, that's a that's a voice. Oh right, yeah. uh-huh. oh, dubbing. See, but most of the dubbing was done by like California people. Oh, is that what you're there saying? You go. Uh, yeah, that's yeah, a... to me that, that that would fit then a California person saying, uh, coming after the fact and you know looking at these this group of uh, a lot of British actors um, over at Pinewood uh, getting getting pulled into the show and someone trying and getting close. <laughs> you know, a lot of this, I think, I just to be is to be an actor in this era, I think, is just something I can't even conceive of and. Uh, like especially the dialect, the dialects involved, since those are so uh, not generational, not not trend. That's not what I'm trying to say. But there have been trends throughout the decades of like the dialects and the the different ways people use their voice on screen and mm-hmm. um, and in voiceover. So yeah, trying to fit the accents into canon is a little bit of an interesting challenge, but still one that I that I like to um, obsess over sometimes. So if we want to make this into like a three hour podcast, there's so much to talk about the, about the, the voice work and the acting in this, in this five minute chunk. I mean, another, another Tell amazing me. thing about this five minutes is the, the fact that we get all of our principles um, or almost all our principles. We, we get, we get Tarkin, but he doesn't, he doesn't speak in this section, but we get, you know, our, our essentially our entire core cast gets to, to do or say something here. Um, and I, I think I counted, five or six different voiceover parts um, with Tadana, including Tadana and possibly including Chewie, um, uh, 3PO, Obi-Wan, um, Vader, and the uh, the guy on the PA in the hangar. Yeah. Which is um, and that's Ben Burton's voiceover. Friends. Oh, that's Ben Burton. Okay. I don't know. Like, uh, yeah, he went with his, he went with his friends to like a, a church and they, recorded in this big o- echoey space just a lot of random voice or a lot of random like pa voices of course of course <laughs> ben, ben burt uh who i now know thanks to the little documentary that showed up on disney plus about boba fett was like on top of being incredible at everything also was like a stylish and handsome dude on top just just like one more thing to make him amazing at that time thanks <laughs> we needed we needed more reasons to be jealous of ben burt <laughs> So all um, the principles. But yeah, but I mean, there's this is you get all these principles, and they're all they're all doing something to me. To me, at least, is really interesting with their the vocal part of their performance. Um, you know, whether whether that's uh, uh, Alec Guinness's, you know. Oh yeah, his, even he's in there. Kind of, that's right. Yeah, yeah. We even get Obi Wan. Um, so you know, his. I, I guess the story ha- has been, and I, I've never heard it properly refuted. You know, that he sort of thought this was like a throwaway job, but. Um, he still kind of came in and and gave 
you know, maybe maybe he only gave an A performance instead of an A plus because his heart wasn't really in it. But that's almost kind of perfect that that calm, wise mentor voice, um, sort of soothing at the end. Um, you know, I love I love Harrison's Ford Harrison Ford's little register shift when he goes to May the Force Be With You. You know, he's he is really trying to connect, and he 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 drops his voice extra low and and soft to do it. Um, classic whiny Luke here um as well um a little, what makes little him wormy. whiny um maybe whiny is the wrong word maybe maybe it's um petulant i guess or or adolescent he just he's, he's we we're talking about this a little bit before he, he just seems so adolescent with his his wild mood swings and his um uh being a little bit too loud and his his big stage whisper uh of of being cocky about shooting womp rats uh, or sorry, bullseyeing womp rats. Um, you know, so we get we like really, you know, Mark Mark Hamill didn't didn't have to do that. Um, he he could have made Luke sound all kinds of ways. He chose to give give him this this um, huge variety of tones and huge variety of of volumes. Um, uh, and it just it works so well for for the wide range of of emotions that Luke is constantly uh, rubber banding between. That's something that I've been uh, just appreciating so much more. Um, I mean, I used to think A New Hope was a little bit outdated. Um, and uh, I almost feel bad saying that. But like like my favorite movies to watch are the prequels, <laughs> which I know, I know people. But um, the originals have, like I am pr- very pro- I, le- I I like all the special edition like upgrades and everything um because I feel like it made the it made the movie like easier for me to watch um without being distracted by I'm watching an old film <laughs> <laughs> but but now that I you know am a grown up and doing going through it in so slowly and also have been you know also now that there's so much content all the time content and also There's the since, c word you brought it out yeah right and trust me it feels even worse being called a supposed content creator well i'm like i'm an artist excuse me <laughs> i make stuff i cannot I, oh, so you're I a refuse, maker i refuse uh, that's fine but i <laughs> i can't i i can't stick i can't I don't want to be in the content ecosystem. I can't even like that stresses me out to even think about. I'm not like <laughs> prolific like that. I'm not like, um, but anyway, um, now that there's just so much. And also since I also am involved in acting and I have, uh, you know, I have been, I have seen the camera side, the on camera side of, of the acting life and the stage side of it. Now that I, um, see performances like Luke and Han and like basically everyone in the original trilogy I have an appreciation for the range of their voice um just because I feel like I see so much more subtle acting now um Mm. like you you see in these performances more subtlety than you saw before no or okay or I see more I see more range less subtlety but Mm. I think the subtlety on camera, I think the subtle, and I think this happens, I think this is happening in multiple areas, but I think this, I think actors can get away with being much more quote unquote subtle and quiet and, and, and um, introspective in while acting now because of cameras and because it's more of like a, a, a camera based thing and um i know for sound editors that can be really hard to pick up dialogue clearly now because Mm -hmm. because um like the training that you do you know to act for stage versus on camera is very different because on camera you can have extreme close-ups and you can speak much softer and you can move much less and you can be much you know more inside of your head almost or much more subtle in that way but sometimes still that doesn't translate and you know I, I feel like I see a lot of really subtle performances that don't have much range sometimes 
I'm brought, mm-hmm. painting a very broad stroke here. There are obviously a really incredible, like there are some, there are lots of incredible actors out there. I'm definitely not, but I, I just think that it's a style thing that like, you know, even if you consider singing because microphones and, and technology is so like, you can like whisper into the mic now, like much mm-hmm. more than you could before just because of technology. So because oh, yeah, technology thank, thank affords. People can, people can finally hear me now that, uh, now that there's microphones. <laughs> <laughs> being, being a bass too for a long time is uh it's it's a lot of people people wondering if there's a thunderstorm somewhere nearby but not realizing that someone's singing oh that's funny that's funny so uh, yeah I, I feel you what i'm saying is like a lot of um a lot of perform and again i'm also i'm also not even talking i'm not even i'm not talking about star wars really the sequel trilogy because i mm-hmm. think like um daisy ridley and i think the whole cast in the sequels is amazing um Mm -hmm. but also like i think of luke and i'm like yeah i could his voice would be compelling even if i wasn't seeing like a close-up of him like it would be compelling even as a radio drama like Mm -hmm. or like Mm -hmm. a stage play and the we don't even need music here like all the actors are kind of giving us this uh, this dynamic range and uh if it were a super subtle performance, like where they all seemed really, I think by subtle, I think I mean really realist, realistic, like um, hyper realism, like as if you weren't even at watching a movie, as if you were just hanging out with your friends and not even being, not even amping up your personality that much, just being really, really casual. Um, I think that's what I'm saying. Yeah, like there's if it were that naturalistic about naturalistic. Daniel Jones in in Star Wars. <laughs> yeah, and I think naturalistic is. Ha- became more of a trend and i think now i think that trend is sure. somewhat crosses over to being a little bit boring sometimes and so that's what i mean by like now going back to this film and being like this is not naturalistic but if but in a way it feels more dynamic to me more expressive yeah, i mean leia and and uh and vader both in this in this section are phenomenal examples of that um you know very, very deliberate stagey choices, um, but also that I wouldn't, I wouldn't change for the world that, that fit this, um, this bombastic uh, movie serials tone. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and some of it does feel like very stagey. Like it, it, some of it feels like, I don't know, very place dialogue. I guess I'm just finding different ways to say that it, it doesn't really sound that naturalistic. But somehow, you know, it could just be familiarity. Um, somehow I, I love it. And I mean, the fact that I, the reason I love it is definitely not necessarily just because of its merit. It, that's definitely just the emotional bond I have with it for sure. So, yeah, these is, things are also Is different. there a, a voice that you find maybe the, the standout, the standout vocal performance of, of either the film or of this section? I... Hmm, so it could stand out could be like the one that doesn't fit or the one that is just uh transcendently great or Han has always been has always stood out as being different. Hmm. Um and sometimes I think it's what makes it work for me and sometimes I feel like it's it's almost the least genuine. And in a way that fits the character, like that shows his his scoundrelly side, or you mean where that the performance feels forced in some kind of way? It might just be his. It might be his dialogue, like mm. just the. But the thing is, Harrison Ford's performance as Han is so. I can't imagine it being any other actor that I can't really, honestly, think clearly about it. I can't like. In my head, I already know that I like it, so uh-huh. pretty much everything I say will probably just justify that. Um, I would have to like erase my memory and see an alternative <laughs> to really mm-hmm. be able to compare. But just like off the bat, he says, "You know, I got some old debts to pay." Like I think maybe it, maybe his dialogue is has a lot of um, exposition. Maybe it has like a lot of explanation, and maybe there's a little bit of. Uh, casualness to his tone slang even that sounds like a little bit 
dorky coming out of his mouth sometimes. Um, yeah, he's like, you know, he, trying so hard to be a scoundrel, but he's like also such a so kind of clean too at the same time. Uh huh. Like, even if I did it, you don't think I'd be fool enough to stick around here, do you? Why don't you come with us? You're like, he's saying, like, he's even, his actions don't, don't even, his actions betray his words even. And I think that's, mm-hmm. and, and I think that's also maybe the point of Han. So, so yeah, I, I, he sticks out, but I can't tell if it's like in a really, really good way or like in a mismatchy way. Do you know what I mean? He's always like, I'm only in it for the money. I'm only, but like, he sticks around. Yeah, he and he yeah. gets them he even, out. He even like tells he's part Luke of it. That Luke's pretty good in a fight when, like, Luke hasn't given much evidence of that. He's just kind of he's, he's being a good older brother figure, or you know that that foil. Um, he's the he's the other. I was thinking of him as the other kind of heart. Uh, you know, if, if Luke's story is is the the growing um, coming of age or building Roman character, that kind of heart of uh, of the film. You know, Han's like uh, someone caught on the edge of good or evil, and 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 uh, his heart always pulling him towards the good is is that other kind of emotional core. I just had the sinking realization that maybe I relate to Han more than I <laughs> <laughs> more than I thought. I don't know why. Why should that be such a bad thing? Well, it's not a bad thing. It's just I. Um, it's just you know it's just shocking sometimes when you realize something when something dawns on you mm-hmm. that you overlooked for so many years like i've been sitting here this whole season being like i don't relate to han at all like i just don't understand (laughs) like he's so far from like (laughs) like han is just Mm. not a character like i'm the opposite actual opposite of han where i just have not really engaged with han at all or just dismissed him and for the record i feel the same way about poe poe is like one of my least like i poe is like my least favorite lead character in this in in the sequels um i just don't get it um (laughs) and i don't think either of them are particularly charming uh although i think like they i see how other people react to them like on screen not even just Mm -hmm. in real life and like i can understand i understand that they are charismatic and i (laughs) and that is something that i don't relate to i don't understand what it's like to like command to have like a presence like that and to i don't know just han has always felt like something someone i can't really understand but now i'm realizing that the fact that he sticks around and still is he whether it's in whether he's trying whether he cares about the rebel cause or whether he just enjoys the company of these of these new friends and kind of wants to wait it out but knows with some like higher in some higher version of his brain that this might not be a good idea for him he should probably get out of trouble he should probably not get involved um and he's kind of you know basically it reminds me of like any time that I've ever done something nice for someone and they're like oh you're so nice and there was a good period of my life that <laughs> until recently where I was very adamant about like no I'm not nice no 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 do not say that. I am not. I am not nice and I'm not helpful. And I would go to great lengths to just to be like, see, no, I'm only doing it for myself because helping you was in my best interest. And like, I would just, for, for some reason, if I, this is like a therapy session, for some reason, find this need to justify my actions to make people understand that it was, I was not being benevolent or nice that i was just (laughs) that it just happened that it was in my best interest to also do this thing that worked out for the other person because i think i just didn't want people to rely on me because they didn't like trust myself if that makes sense Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and and for what this is worth we're relative therapy session over right (laughs) yeah uh but for what what this is worth uh, someone saying like spending a long time saying like that's not really okay. me. I don't really relate to that. I don't really relate to that. And then at the end, kind of being like, oh, maybe it me. That does sound like Han. <laughs> 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 for what that's worth, right? For, free advice is worth what you paid for it, but still. And that's, well, then. Uh, my, my, my that, that's when we... <laughs> well, uh, 
yeah, yeah. this would be where like hit uh, an old radio station where to hit the cough button and have a sip and uh, <laughs> maybe change the record. Um, so, uh, so anyway, so uh, th- th- these five minutes. Yes. So, okay. So, Biggs. 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 What What do you think about Biggs, Anthony? I think he's fine. Mm-hmm. And I pay attention to him more now only because I know only because the other parts of the fandom have made me interested, if that makes sense. So Biggs was not someone that I immediately took to as a kid. I was just, I mean, who would? Like, unless you have saw the extras and or just like really cared about pilots or just mm-hmm. whatever, like just, he, he, you know, he doesn't really last for very long on screen. And um, yeah, Biggs is cool. Nothing good or bad to say about him. He's cool. Um, he's, but now he's I'm more another interested. example of a like that Star Wars uh, episode four, A New Hope accent. That's like sound. In this case, it sounds like a British person trying to trying and mostly succeeding at doing an American accent. It's, but it, it feels a little forced. Hey, you coming up? I'll be right up there with you. And if I got stories to tell you, you sure you can handle this shit, sir? Luke is the best bush pilot in the outer rim territories. The way he says pilot, you do all right. I was like, is he Australian? Yeah, he's he's got that classic. Get back, all right? Right. Hey, big. He's got the classic like American plus English equals Aussie thing. Um, or like I, I went to high school in England very briefly and people would make fun of me by by talking like an American. And like he's got a little bit of that. You know, he's the best Bush pilot in all the Outer Rim territories. He hits those R's like a little too hard. Oh, interesting. So um, my family's or like I'm an Australian citizen and my mom has a my mom was well my mom was born in greece but raised in australia so she um most of my family on her side is in australia now and they like they have either like greek australian hybrid accents or some of them have like fully australian accents and it sounds i know that there are something like i know there are different regions but no 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 um but my mom has like a hybrid american Australian accent because she moved she came here for grad school and then just stayed and then I was born here so by here I mean the U.S. and so my mom's accent I like I didn't realize that she had she didn't have a strong enough Australian accent for me to recognize that she had an Australian accent growing up but all of my friends would be like your parents have accents and I'd be like no they don't what are you talking about (laughs) like your parents both talk funny and they both had, have different accents. They're both they're both immigrants from different places. And my mom, I was like, she definitely does not have an accent. But then in sixth grade, it was revealed to me that I said some words funny too. And I did not know that. But like I picked up a few Australian <laughs> words from my mom. But like in just like thrown into the midst of my very like California um, American accent. So it would just just these like random words slipped in there that my mom still had so like yeah. ordinary things or, or like, yeah did it you was have the australian nigh for no no it, it was no because i would have noticed that it was like words that mm-hmm. didn't maybe come up enough or like that wouldn't be it, it was like the same types of words too with the same types of of sounds so it would be like anything spelled you with ull at the end like now so i know like n- I've trained myself because of people making fun of me <laughs> to say like I'm full, but I would say I'm full. Like I would use a long, like a long U on everything, um, or like you know, can you like I'm go- can you pull that door for me? Like just random things where like if you weren't really listening carefully, you would miss it. But if you hung out with me a lot, you would notice that I always talk like that. Or like you know, wool like. I would say mm-hmm. this shirt is made out of wool. 
and just things like that. And also anything with like, or with a double E. So I, these feel like similar things to me, like mm -hmm. a double E, like where have you been mm -hmm, instead of mm -hmm. been. And so uh, those were like little things that slipped out. And so Biggs here, it sounds, I can hear that like little words, little, little things slipping out in the same way. So you think we're, we've successfully diagnosed that he is, uh, he's an English person trying to sound American. Well, I'm not sure exactly because the way he says bush pilot reminds me of more of an Australian accent, but it mm -hmm. might also be just because he's saying bush pilot. And some reason that sounds <laughs> <Yeah>. more Aussie. <laughs> I don't, I don't know. Um, I, I did a little bit picture the like uh, gyrocopter pilot from uh, Mad Max and Road Warrior. I still haven't seen that. But Aussie, and maybe it's like Outer wait, wait, Rim wait, wait. Territories sounds like an I think it's like his line is also has that effect um, of skewing my, perce my perception. Because what is a bush pilot? Yeah, I mean, I, it, we know crop dusters are a thing in, in Star Wars, right? Uh, thank, thanks to Han. Um, uh, so I, I have to assume it's it's something like that. I mean... It, like where in, are the in bushes life, in Tatooine? <laughs> in real life, it's that it's the person that's like you know the because they have a plane can communicate between all of the all these homesteads in the outback. But um, yeah, I don't know what I don't know what role that is, especially now that we've seen Book of Boba Fett and we realize that um, Tatooine actually has like these gigantic cities with complex infrastructures that is not necessarily the like. Um, uh, the farthest place from the bright center of the galaxy as Luke, as Luke understood it. Um, but yeah, I don't know who the, who the bush pilots are in Tatooine. Hmm. We, well. we decided as a, uh, as a gaming group, I was running a, um, a Star Wars role playing game for a long time with some close friends. And we decided that the outer rim just had to be Australia because, of, because of all these little, like little hints. So it was, it was definitely the outer rim um, for a, for a long time. So fit, uh, it fits for me, but that's my real small, narrow personal bias. Well, all right. Australian bigs. Um, that can be a Done. thing now. So, uh, yeah. So the original or like the version of the script that is, I think it was George Lucas's fourth version or something, says, um, Red Leader, a rugged, handsome man in his 40s, comes up behind Luke and Biggs. He has the confident smile of a born leader. And that's that's the guy who says, are you sure you can handle the ship? Um, so, yeah, that's that's Red Leader for you. Rugged. Casting is an art, an art, not a science. Rugged. Well, do you think do you think he was do you think the casting doesn't match up? It maybe doesn't totally for me, but uh, maybe I need to scrub through again. But um, I cannot picture Red Leader in my mind. I can't picture people's faces unless they have something very distinct or like I've seen them a lot so especially in this in this scene without his helmet mm. yeah I can, I can I can picture him with his helmet on later on in the film I can picture his voice better than I can like picture his face that's for sure mm -hmm. and I do love the this is now Star Wars visual minute for a second but I do love the little detail that I, I so rarely think about that um because he's a squadron leader he's got um the like gold or brass colored um uh, visual accents on his helmet. Oh, I didn't notice that. Cool. Um, so this whole time, like we haven't been talking about the fact that there's, they're still in this warehouse that they, I mean, or hangar, this hangar, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which is a cavernous, like we can hear it in all, in all their voices. And we can hear like all the clanking and all of the like sh ships and all the fighters like getting ready in the background. And the, final minute of this set of five minutes is this incredible like just buzzing of final preparations it's just like the various things let me just play let me just play it uh, it's yeah boring would you more rp from c3po yeah It reminds me a little bit of like gearing up for pod racing too. Yes. 
minutes is like the whole final minute. See, it's a good thing there's no music here, right? It's tremendous. It's so powerful. And that's the tiny bit of music that we hear. Yeah. And, the, and that's the, the handoff to, to voiceover straight to music uh, without. And, and I, I get just a little a little tiny thing that that, you know, could have been make or break here. But without a pause to go back to the engine sounds or the machine sounds um, to just go straight to voiceover to music with with no like real pause in the middle. But the engine sounds still have are going on in the background. It's just the mm -hmm. music. It's the handoff into the focus. Like, what is the focus? Yes. And I think that's what's, I mean, I think that's what works about it for me. Is it, it still is going on, but it's like the, the voice, like the music, if it's the emotional, uh, what's it called? The carrot, not carrot, the thing that you follow, it's like the emotional, it's the thing that carries, it's the emo emotional <laughs> anchor, it's the emotional mm. thing that guides us. Uh, guiding star, it's the emotion, it's the mm -hmm, guiding mm -hmm. star. That final like coaching bit for Luke is what leads him directly into starting the adventure or like the next thing, starting his thing, getting on stage. That's what it is. He gets on yeah, stage. Yes. There we go. That's the final we, person. That's we yeah. have places with all of the you know. Uh, the the th tubes being popped into things and fuel draining in one direction or another and engines revving and then yeah and then once it's places show yeah. show's about to start it's the lights the camera first you know mm -hmm. last minute costume ad adjustments the guitar has been put on stage everything's been <laughs> tuned everything's on you hear the little you hear the <laughs> you hear the feedback of uh, yep everything's on the PA. And, and, and now Luke's Dr. getting taps on stage. his desk or his uh, his music stand, and <laughs> this is a very we're all multi. This is a very interesting concert. And then Luke flies <laughs> in his X wing on stage. Um, <laughs> yeah, like you yeah, do. Yeah, it, uh, it in a way is a, a lovely. I mean, you know, these five minutes aren't designed in five minute chunks by by Bird or anything, but there is a cool um, uh, return to the beginning with the the slow ramp up of um non-musical non-human sounds again like we got with in in that mini uh, version talking about the uh the computer graphic and then at the end we have another just that and again maybe universal maybe not as you were talking about before but that slow ramp up of volume um and and of com complexity and it's 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 like it almost sounds like we're standing next to one engine the whole time it feels like a continuous like uh, like we're we're not moving relative to that sound of that, but other sounds come in and that then keeps getting louder and then it seems to like hit a new a new gear a new tone and then other noises come in, um, just in inexorably pushing us forward. And the thing is, it's like an ensemble cast here. Like it's it's not just one ship gearing up to fly somewhere. It's we hear all of them. Like it's. You know, it's it's not a solo singer going on stage. It's like a really big number where like a lot of people are involved. And here it's a very much a group effort where they're all going to take shots. They're all going to, you know, try this thing together. It's, you know, they're they may be small, but they are a squadron and they're, you know, or hmm. whatever they are at this point. But they are a team and they are, you know, working together. So we hear everyone getting ready in their own way. And unlike the pod race where we do hear all the like gearing up of the pod races but they're competing with each other here mm -hmm. it's like mm -hmm. they're all gearing up their own situation but on the same team it's so cool it's so it's so brilliant and it's so simple and it's it's so it's so fake when you stop and think about it like every other kind of music movie soundscape um you know it it, it doesn't make any sense how we're hearing uh, things with what what exactly is loud and and, and quiet at, at given points but um i think it makes but it's it's close sense. enough 
Yeah, exactly. It, it makes enough sense. It makes emotional sense as we, you know, suddenly zoom inside the cockpit and can hear inside of Luke's head and also outside of Luke's head. And, uh, and there's been no interruption to this, uh, to that other ongoing sound. I think that that's because we're in Luke's head there, but mm -hmm. the, I'll read what it says in the, in the script there. It says mm -hmm. all final preparations are made for the approaching battle. The hangar is buzzing with the last minute activity as the pilots and crewmen alike make their final adjustments. The hum of activity is occasionally trespassed by the distorted voice of the loudspeaker issuing commands. Coupling hoses are disconnected from the ships as they are fueled. Cockpit shields roll smoothly into place over each pilot. A signalman holding red guiding lights directs the ship. Luke, a trace of a smile gracing his lips, peers about through his goggles. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. The, the little details that are all there and all like interpreted by the, by the huge team of artists that ended up producing the final product in, in their own way, but they're, they're still all there. Yep. I mean, and assuming that the script was made before the sound was put in there, like that, like if that were definitely the case, which I don't know for sure, but uh, if we were to assume that, then then we could say that like it's not that the sound designers, the sound team, just saw this warehouse, saw this hangar, and said, "Okay, let's put hustle bustle sounds in there." Like <laughs> it 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 yeah. is a more specific direction of like uh, there's it's definitely like uh, there's more specifics to hang on to there. More yeah, there's no one in the background going like rutabaga, rutabaga, rutabaga. Right. So it feels uh, more it feels more tangible because there is like specific things that they're going after, not just make it sound like a realistic hanger. Like, you know. The the there's one standout element of that that irked me a tiny bit. I don't Okay, what is it? Let's hear sound it. Sound like a a, no, it's all right. a complainer, but that that on on this rewatch, I was like, oh, that's okay. Um the Im imperfections are what make the perfect the perfect moments uh better right so so um there is this there's a voiceover every time or every time but one that we get an establishing shot of the hangar oh there's this like perfectly timed like and and very like uh you know, film school 101 thing of like, if you have an establishing shot of a big area, you can show, you can make the audience feel how big it is by having, having an echoey voiceover, you know, PA system thing. Mm -hmm. And they, but they, in this five minutes, it happens like seven or eight times or something like that. <laughs> um, so, it, you know, we, we, at one, at one point, I think we go from a PA, like a, there's a PA element and then we cut to, um, uh, we cut to Vader and Tarkin and and not to discount when we cut to Vader and Tarkin and the the baseline um like room sound if you will a room tone is suddenly totally different and totally deeper and more of the like the, the death star death star that death star throb um and then we cut back and it's only been like 6 seconds or 8 seconds or something and we get another PA with another establishing shot um Mm. They're, they're you know maybe in in universe or in canon or something there's a perfectly good reason for that but when it happens so many times in this short era it, it sticks out a little bit like yes we we know that you're supposed to do this we know that this is what a textbook would say don't need to maybe do it every single time oh interesting okay let's let me see if i can let's hear some of that the moon with the rebel base will be in range in so death star this will be a day long remembered it has seen the end of Kenobi and will soon see the end of the rebellion. I hear, yeah. So, you got your reward and you just leave? Yeah, so as soon as we get. Uh, yeah. And so you're saying it happens a few times? It happens. It happens enough that it stuck out, and that's always the challenge of doing the by, movies by minute format. Uh, you notice some of that stuff, but um, yeah, there, there's a there's a lot more cuts to establish that we're in a hangar than we probably really need. Uh, I, I wonder to what extent that's that's also to do with the the changing of the rhythm um, by including the big scene. Um, as a, speaking as someone who's a, a, about a thousand years old, I, I 
<laughs> I, I also I'm always still caught by surprise with the the, the inclusion of the big scene. It, it it feels a little bit like um like if I ordered a meal at a restaurant and they gave me an extra side for free, and I'm I'm like uh, uh I I have a I have a full meal already. It's nice to get something for free. That's that's probably tasty. But I, I already I already knew what I was ordering and I, it was going to be plenty. Mm. Um, uh, you know, not not unwelcome, but also uh, the chances that I'll feel like it was the highlight of the of the of the thing are, are small. But um, uh, I wonder. I, I'm fascinated. To, would be fascinated to know more about the way the sound design and the the rhythm of the sound design changed with these little um, these little scenes that, that probably had to get, get designed on sound designed on their own, um, both originally and then for the re their re inclusion and then someone had to step back and say like, and now what does this change about our overall feeling for this scene or for this, this moment? I mean, do, do you, I mean the original, I, I'm sure you've seen the deleted big scene, right? Yes, 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 of course. So I'm, you're surprised that they didn't, when they cut that, you're surprised that they didn't also cut this. Uh, because if they yeah. filmed them all, then then I would yeah, say it's, it's it, not necessarily inserted. It's was meant to be there. And then the one was I, cut. And then the one was cut. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm just curious about how that, how that rhythm changed back and forth. And if we had a million years to, to record, I, I would be really interested to watch this five minute chunk, you know, from all editions side by side and see what changes. So uh, something like rather listen, listen to what changes. So something that I've noticed going, by, you know, preparing, um, you know, uh, like studying the scripts to prepare for the rest of the season. Something that I've noticed uh, is how the frequency of loudspeaker voices gets, it increases like over the course mm. of this, like, at, mm. I, I think it's like next week or the week after, there's like every, there's so much that's like over the loudspeaker or over the headset or over the something because they're, having to because they're like entering mat battle so there's a lot of instructions and there's a lot of like five minutes till this 30 set like you know m certain minutes to this so i just noticed in general a lot of loudspeaker stuff haven't really um thought of it in relationship to establishing shots or this or the sound of them but i will pay attention now um but the sense that i have gotten is that there's just like loudspeaker happening a, there's a lot of loudspeaker happening so like that's not like mm -hmm. the one loudspeaker that happens every five minutes happens to hap come right when we go back to that shot to me it's like oh there's like a continuous stream of loudspeaker announcements and so cutting back to the scene like the loudspeaker announcements at this point are like part of the ambience of mm -hmm. just this scene but it also does serve that dual purpose like it, it you know there is a little bit of both I mean I think it only I think it flies I think it passes for me without ringing as like a oh they're doing the film school thing like thing that they're supposed to do in film school mm -hmm. only because it is also for me believable that just at this point before they're about to enter the battle of heaven the loudspeaker has a lot to say and it has a lot of preparations um uh you know it's like the flight it's the pilot is stopping to announce a lot of things like you can't can finish watching your movie because they're like <laughs> <laughs> 30 minutes to descent now put pack your things last call for the bathrooms like now everyone put your seatbelts on last call for the beverages all right now we're starting our descent five minutes till we planned blah 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 <laughs> it's like so is this the the symphonic or i guess a, a excuse me orchestral version of of you know slowly introducing another instrument and another instrument and another instrument and another instrument, while the others are all playing and, and, and that, that, a, that continued um, increase in, in mm. number of variables leading us towards something bigger. No, this is still backstage where okay. if I'm like, if I'm backstage, this is when like, like an hour before show is when, or, you know, like two hours before show, like I'm thinking about like when I was on tour and it was like a very stable schedule. And, and so there was, uh, you know, two hours you would be like this. Okay, this is your dinner call. Then it would be like, all right, make sure you get into costumes. All right, you know, God. one hour till till walk till stage or like whatever. One hour till band call. Like, all right, thirty thirty minutes. All right, I mean, I'm gonna need you all to walk to stage soon. Like, it would be like an increasingly like increasing amount of announcements to make sure that we are where we needed to be. 
And so that's what, like, this is for me, you know? And last call for this, last call for that. The wardrobe's the coming over. Blah, blah, blah. Make sure you plug in. Everyone tuned? Like, check in with the stage crew. Check in with the tech. Blah, blah, blah. blah. Like, lots, lots happening um, to prepare. Yeah, yeah. I can relate to that in a, in a whole number of ways. And, and, and then... Uh, something, something beautiful in those, even in this five minute chunk, but only three and a half seconds, but of handing it off to um, a, a lead instrument, like a, like a violin. I couldn't tell if it was violins and violin cello or, or not. I'm not certainly not enough an expert to recognize, but um, handing it off to a, to a, a big sweeping music, musical piece to say like, all right, now we're going. Mm -hmm. You mean at the end of the minutes when the music, at the very on. end of this, yeah, this chunk. Yeah. It's a group effort. It's a lot of instruments. The strings. Okay. I the thought strings, I heard, yeah. It? I thought I heard even piano in the back. Let's hear. Luke, the force will be with you. I did hear, I did hear a little bit of a plink. It could have been harp or something but it, there is a full orchestra happening there but they're moving in like um it's homophonic so which mm -hmm. means that all the voices are moving at the same time mm -hmm. basically so it's like stacked it's like dee, 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 dee. um yeah but the strings are are at the forefront there with some other things happening i'm pretty sure there's like a harp thing there might be a piano thing um, but I heard that too. And that leads us to the I Battle of Yavin. I wouldn't never want to be a um an ill behaved guest, but uh I I was kind of curious to put you on the spot, Anthony, and ask like how much how much were you were you able to unpack from that three and a half seconds of, of music? I mean I, I feel like I noticed a couple of interesting things, but I'm What what do you mean by unpack and what did you notice? <laughs> um which is the uh, appropriate conversational uh, judo to do there um i i noticed it i noticed that it's it's feels rot like it's rising if that's even the mm -hmm. right word but um but not without a little setback or a little step back mm -hmm. step down in the middle um uh i i found that like it's it it suddenly feels like a whole bunch of instruments, like a whole bunch of players working together, but I couldn't tell if it was the whole string section or the whole orchestra behind the strings or just a bunch of violinists or, you know, one that's been doubled. Um, they, they sort of like there was a, a somewhat disguising of what all the instruments are there um, because the, the strings are sort of plowing us forward or um, pulling us forward like like dogs in a, do in a dog sled. Like we're, we're going, they're, they're going, so we're going. Um, uh, I I thought I thought it was really hard to sing. I kept trying to like hum it or sing it to yes. myself. I found it incredibly difficult to do so, and I could not tell you why. Okay, okay, okay. So first, let me let me play that again. Um, yeah. I'll play it yeah, yeah. straight from the beginning of the Battle of Yavin track, so you can hear it better. So that's the extent to what we hear where it's basically just like it's like okay so it's funny cuz in music school we we like take a lot of theory and then we do a lot of ear training and a lot of like both sight singing and dictation so it'll be like an easy type of assignment would be if you if if the instructor played like then if you got the starting pitch it would that would be considered a relatively easy thing to write out something like this would would be harder because of the chromaticism because it's uh there's a lot more like accidental notes happening and it doesn't follow as much of an established pattern that we're used to. And if you add to that, like doing um, like polyphonic dictation, which is like, if they give you like four voices, like, I don't know. Um, I, um, 
Like, what am I trying to do? Like, like that would also be, it would be a step harder, but it would be also somewhat quote unquote easy because each of the voices has such a com- clearly different um, role. Like they have different rhythms basically. Like you can hear the left hand, two notes there. You can tell that's definitely different. <laughs> this is so, I'm playing Bach Partita uh, in B flat, by the way. So it would be easier to follow. But here, since it's homophonic, it's planar movement, which it, it because it's all moving at the same time. And it, it's like, you couldn't even tell if it was one instrument or like doubled or, or whatever. It's because it, it's all moving at the same time. So it might as well just be one instrument, but playing chord, a moving chord. It's the type of thing where you try to follow one line and then you kind of switch to a different line. Uh, You know, you kind of switch to a different part of the harmony Mm -hmm. because they're all moving at the same time. So I don't know if that answers your question, but when things are moving all at the same time, it is much harder to, detect the separation because you're not getting as much like texture or you're not getting as much other cues to Mm -hmm. help you separate the different parts that are happening so it is i i agree it is very hard to it's much harder to sing something like that you don't have a clear sense of which what the melody is yeah terrifying Uh, as as a former bass singer t- terrifying not to be able to have like the the load star of the soprano gu- guiding the whole oh. song uh uh so that i can just hum hum something uh dumb in the background um uh yeah i guess that's 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 a lot of what what stood out to me um and the question of like where does it start you know i listened to the the, the last five seconds a, a million times in a row because i could tell the last three and a half is where the, the strings are kicking in but there's um, there's either a subtle blending or I need to get my ears checked. It could very well be both. Um, but I, I couldn't quite, couldn't figure out where does the mu- where does the music start and the, uh, not necessarily the dialogue end, but where, where is it? The, where's the overlap? Well, I, I guess that's a unique aspect of film scoring in that mm. like the starts to things can be sort of soft starts or that purposely trail in like this, it's not that this trails in, but it's not the same thing as like, like it's not the same start <laughs> as like, this is the start of a piece. It's more like, because if yeah. you hear it in context, I'll play it in context. Like the way it starts is really meant to be a little bit more transition y. Because mm-hmm. now we're transitioning into. more right so it's like and the other thing is this piece of music or like this whole part of the score is like an action set piece so it's not it it it, it's meant to go with the action you know it's a set piece or you know it's, it's an action set piece so it's not like a contained song necessarily so I think what you said about how it kind of leads in it's kind of sneaks in almost i think that's that sounds accurate I think that's to me. more like the performers moving from like triple p to f or do you think that's like everyone were playing it and then uh with the with the synthesizer at the end um think... slowly ramping it up wait synthesizer or not synthesizer but um my, my, my lack of expertise is showing here but like uh you know, in in the editing or do you think it, it's like someone played that opening a little bit louder and in in the edit they actually artificially started it softer and and built it up see the thing is i don't think it's that soft Mm. here it's soft and so if we play it in the context of the minutes um Luke, the Force will be with you. But I will say, now playing it in the context, it maybe seems soft because there's also other stuff happening. So it's all relative, you know, to the whole entire mix. 
Yeah. Yeah, the power of the, of the, the sound mixers. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it is <laughs> alone on the soundtrack. It's, it's actually not that soft. The part that comes after is softer. But the part that comes after, maybe it sounds more present because of the instrumentation and maybe because it is more out in the open. Whereas the soaring of the ships is over that. Yeah. Good. If you were questions. if you were playing in that string section, would you find that section? I mean, again, yeah, as a singer, I found it very difficult to, to to reproduce. But if you're playing in the string section, would it feel like this is a this is a perfectly rote um, little little section to play? Um, I wouldn't say rote. Um, do you mean would it be hard? Yeah. Personally, Whatever that means. I don't. I don't think so. Like, compare, especially compared to like how gnarly some parts of the Star Wars score are. I mm. would say this. This would be not that gnarly. Com- probably, probably because it's it's written on a pretty friendly register of the violin, and <laughs> it moving with other strings. There's like a power in it. Um, there's a power mm. in moving at the same time as other sh- as other string players. I, I just. I have to tell you, like, I don't miss being like super, super entrenched in the classical world, but I do miss playing an orchestra because there's something like really special about playing with other people on your same part that is can't be replicated by just at home. Like in the intro and outro music to this podcast, like I always record that and, you know, I record my own music and everything and I will double, triple, quadruple, like I will layer my own violin playing on the same part to kind of emulate like a small section. And I can, doing that is not the same as if I had a bunch of other violinists with me and we're all playing it at the same time. You know, it it is like a home studio hack, I guess, that like a singular composer slash violinist will do it to to layer on themselves. But um, it's harder to, like you're moving without a reference, sort of. And there are certain like micro adjustments and my, and there's, there is, it's just, diff- it's just different when you're actually playing with people. And so I, I think something like this, because it's, it's so, um, the, the movement is so together and also like the violins have, are playing in octaves too. And it's, you know, all the violins are playing the same at the same time. And even like violas and like, it's, I think this would be, kind of it would be really nice to play compared to like some other harmonically like note wise I think I would have to like make sure I checked myself on the on the notes though that's definitely not rote there's like a it's there's a lot of like accidentals and you know and stuff like that is there for you an immediate reference of uh the gnarliest part of the Star Wars score if this is not Um, one of the gnarliest Ben the Ben Kenobi's death springs to mind mm-hmm. as being mm-hmm. really gnarly <laughs> Ben's death and the and the and the fighter attack mm-hmm. very gnarly uh well, yeah. hard 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 transitions in there and very well very fast very mm-hmm. very like acrobatic violin parts that jump around a lot so John Williams's music is pretty hard it's very hard I would have I would have guessed so, but of course, listening to the, the so much of uh, this and 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 last season, last Jedi season, uh, yeah, seems like it really is. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but also also very rewarding. So there's different types of hard. Uh, yeah, there's yeah, there's different types of hard. Yeah. Some types of hard are, the, are hard, but not as rewarding because it's hard just because it's written clunky, written in a clunky mm-hmm. way. It doesn't necessarily sound impressive. It's just written in a <laughs> clunky way, um, a clunky way. So, the, very good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's I spent a lot of time singing madrigals in college, and um, uh, Talus always makes you feel like any work you did was worth it. Uh, like Thomas Talus. Thomas Talus. Yeah, because because everybody gets something amazing to do. Um, again, even even the basses, which felt felt relatively rare, but. Um, What's an example of like, a madrigal by Thomas Tallis? Um, I'm not super familiar they're, with they're, his work. I only know his like, you know, the Von the, the Von Williams. Ray Von Williams based on Fantasia Tallis. based yeah based on the theme by Thomas Tallis. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to think, mostly the 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 names from them are mostly just whatever 
Bible quote there. Oh, okay, okay. Um, uh, I'll find one and put a link sing, to it. Sing, sing one before I... Um, uh, ver- verily, verily, I say unto you is probably my, my favorite. Mm, um, okay. Where even, like, again, even, even for me, knowing that, of course, the, the tenors and the sopranos are the real stars of the show, but um, even the bass, bass line, just from the beginning, just, like, sort of could, could function as a solo. It's like... Um, Verily, verily, I say unto you, except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood. Like, there's just, just for a dumb old bass who's usually just supposed to be like, like if you take like a, a John Taverner thing from the late 20th century the bases are just gonna kind of hum a bunch or maybe say ooh mm-hmm. uh, <laughs> uh even though those are also you know, really musically complex and beautiful um that's that's for me that's the kind of hard work as you're talking about like hard work that's not rewarding that's john taverner the end product is wonderful and it's difficult but it's, it's right. isn't much for me to do that's that can be said i think a lot of bases and cellos feel that way where they're just <laughs> post, supposed to be the like i don't know the boring old like they're not much movement but i'm curious um your voice seems low enough to sing like palpatine and snoke's themes are they is it but what do you think of those what do you think of those um do those seem like fun parts fun things to sing or is it hard to compare everything's more fun when it's star wars but Mm, yeah um uh you know you get get Give me a paper paper plate to eat my birthday cake on, and if it's a Star Wars plate, I'm, uh, that cake is more delicious. But um, and if it's Star Wars cake, uh, even better. Uh, oh yeah! Oh wow! <laughs> now now we're we're uh, really transcending. Um, but yeah, there there isn't as much there isn't as much to do, you know. And it, um, I, this is stuff probably better better save for those those films in those minutes. But um, it doesn't feel in. From my my again pretty non expert opinion doesn't feel like uh, Williams is as adroit with his use of the voice as an instrument in his orchestra mm. as some of the other instruments, oh. especially brass and strings. Interesting. It'll be maybe something to revisit. Yes, especially in the not so much in the not as much in the originals, but when when we get to the prequels, there will be a lot more to talk about with the voice. Uh, yeah. Duel, Duel of the Fates, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and can't forget Oda Ganga, that, that whole thing. Yes. Um, but anyway, uh, did you have anything else that you wanted to mention about the how you felt about the soundscape in this set of minutes? I know that you you said um, some parts I'm, reminded I'm you pre- of some stuff. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, mainly, I'm, I'm impressed how much, um, uh, with with your kind assistance, we we were leading the way. We were able to pull out of three and a half seconds of music. Um, pr- pretty good to get like five or ten minutes of discussion out of the tiniest little um, sliver of, of a sample here. Um, the other the other thing I was thinking of, um, and again, lots of personal bias here, but but maybe it'll resonate with a, with another listener. Um, is just how good um, Bert and the whole design and editing team are at. Um, at isolating it, like in, if it were a visual metaphor, you know, giving us like or, or changing the focus or, you know, giving us close ups in, in some places that still include some of the other sounds in the frame, but, but really, you know, zoom into a moment. Um, and I was thinking about uh, uh, probably pretty immature and adolescent uh, revelation that I had at like 19. Um, but at the time it felt like a huge deal as everything does in, in that age. Um, that like all of my favorite song, like pop songs, like guitar rock songs, um, all had a moment where uh, the the band or the musician has established all of the the major themes and all the instruments and got us up to a you know just about a fever pitch and then pulls almost all of it down to isolate one element and it's not even a new element necessarily but um, drops us down for a second to just. Uh, you know, like a film metaphor, like sudden smash close up to a thing, and there's there's just enough there to know that the song is still going. But we, um, in a way that's maybe different from like a Hendrix guitar solo, where 
um that's that's almost more the crescendo of the thing um these are like pop songs from the late 90s and early 2000s where um it's like a sudden decrescendo or just a, a sudden little everything else gets quiet we're focusing in on one little thing and that that happens a bunch in these minutes it happens a bunch in this film um it happens a bunch in the the movies that um were the most obvious direct inspirations for this um uh, like the, the classic American Westerns and, and the burgeoning uh, Japanese films that uh, Lucas is drawing on, but where, yeah, there's stuff, there's stuff there, but we're just going to, we're just going to pause or mostly pause on all of it for a second to give you a little audio isolation and you get it in, um, you get it in all the quiet and, and, and total, you know, lack of underscore in some of these dialogue moments. Um, you get it in, uh, the way we, we ramp up that, um, uh, uh, the complexity of the soundscape right before Vader speaks and the moon Vader speaks, it's, it's, is breathing and, and the, um, and the voiceover and that the hum of the death star seems to suddenly diminish or you get it with the voiceover of, um, of Obi-Wan, you know, this, this sudden jump inside Luke's head and we get enough of the engine sounds and stuff still there to remind us that we haven't, um, we haven't jumped to a new scene or something like that, or we haven't changed in time and place really, but we're just doing this sudden subtle, close up that so that when we pop out of it um everything has been continuous and at the same time not continuous at all at the same time like these these big dramatic swings it's a subito, it's, it's more of a subito change thank you thank you yeah yeah um and it just it struck me it struck me how powerful that is to be able to simultaneously be maintaining a thing and also seem to jump around a lot in that thing and to do that with do that with sound without it it feeling jarring, but instead feeling like as, as subtle and natural as changing, you know, rat racking the focus in a camera. So what examples of the, of songs, um, I'll put, I'll timestamp exactly when they happen in the show notes. Sure. Yeah. I, I this is, um, hopefully not gonna, but uh, if make me maybe like someone will know, hipster, but, but maybe someone will, will relate to this, uh, uh, the songs that, that really like for, for me really did that. The pop songs that there were things like, um, uh, Yola Tango's Sugar Cube has a really powerful moment. It's a very noisy guitar rock song. And then there's a real, there's just a, this little pause about um, pre preparing for these minutes. I also noticed they're all about four fifths of the way through the song, which probably, probably says something. It's a golden something, ratio thing. It, golden ratio thing. There you go. Um, or uh, the song Stones by Sonic Youth has a very, like very obvious and drawn out version of this. It's like a pretty long for a guitar rock song, but, um, and so the, the, the sudden isolation of one instrument moment. It's like a sudden um, stripping away. Yeah. Yeah. So that lasts a long time. Um, there's a, a Buffalo daughter song called earth punk rockers that does the same thing that I, I thought of <laughs> five or 10, um, examples previous to, to this, but, um, those are the ones that do it really obviously. And I think really effectively, uh, and to me are like a metaphor for this great des sound design in or, or symbolic of the same great sound design as in Star Wars. It's interesting that watching this scene and listening to this scene and hearing the like sudden uh, sound design changes or or whatever, the, the, those sudden changes, those sudden stripping away of, 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 you know, soundscape reminded you of similar occurrences in music, which honestly, like, uh, I don't know if I would have drawn that made that connection but i i totally get it like once you explain it i totally get it so that's that's cool um not a disaster yay communicating with humans all right <laughs> yeah that, that's yeah that, that's cool um <laughs> yeah in in i guess in music in not in music but like in a score or in, you know, classical music, which uses mm -hmm. Italian terminology or whatever, like that is something mm -hmm. that would very, like when that happens in, it happens, it's, 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 it's not uncommon, like in symphonies and in, in whatever, like there will be like, a, especially like listen to a Beethoven symphony or something, there'll be moments that are like subito piano, but then it's like a crescendo. But the, the thing that's interesting about these changes is it's not just, um, like normally when we think of dynamics changes in, in classical music, we think of like, or in, in any music, we think of subtle, at least think of something growing or something fading, you know, basically something that is progressively changing. But also there's this other set of dynamic changes that can just be like sudden shifts. Like suddenly it's 
all stripped away or like suddenly it's louder without being incremental about it. And that would be called a, a sudden, a subito, sudden change. So okay. you might be playing something that's like fortissimo, super, super loud. And then it might be like subito piano. And then it's this moment where like people almost gasp because they're like, where did it go? Oh, but they're still barely there. But they're, but they're still, bar- but like, yeah, it's cool. Like, I don't know. I just, I have fond memories of like, rehearsing those subito moments to make sure and it's you, you never want to be the one person in the orchestra that accidentally <laughs> kept playing loud when it was supposed to be a subito uh-huh. piano <laughs> yeah <laughs> but it, it's maybe it's almost that moment of apprehension when you, you're a little kid and you jump off the swings and you go up for a, a tiny bit and then you're 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 in microgravity for just a split second and you feel like you could you could move in any direction all of a sudden you're totally weightless and then you plunge yeah and you can't keep going up forever. So sometimes you need those times to go down. And, and especially in like pop and rock music, that's, you know, it's a commonly, you know, you'll go, you'll drop down before ramping up for the final big chorus or something. But in order for that final moment to be like super impactful, you have to sometimes come down and, or it's effective to, to come down. Um, and so, yeah, that's cool. Um, on a fun, are, are you ready for the Star Wars Music Minute questionnaire? I feel ready. Okay. Let's find out together. Let's do it. Let's do it. Um, in exactly three words, what does Star Wars sound like? I'm worried this answer has already been taken by now. Oh, that's okay. I have a, I have an alt if needed. There's John, no need to. Okay. <laughs> ben James. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, m- much respect to, um, I, I cannot remember which guest uh, said William Spurt and jones but that person was no, i think they correct. i think they said john i think they may have said john ben james too <laughs> well, it was uh, i think it was nani from triad of the force in episode 13 it's, it's thank, you. I, thank you yeah i think um and that's I hopefully love that it. goes without explanation but, yeah I, um uh, all, all respect to james o. jones just getting a theater in new york named after him a couple days ago and oh sweet um, uh, you know, all, all of the other, the many, many deserved accolades that have been rained down on these people. Uh, not enough as far as I'm concerned. That's awesome. Um, yeah, the, I didn't the, know that the, the court, theater, the court, the court theater, which is one of the Schubert theaters in, uh, in Manhattan, um, is, uh, is going to be named the James Earl Jones. Theater. That's awesome. Okay. Question number two, what is something related to star Wars music or sound that you're interested in or want to learn more about? You've graciously answered uh, a lot of my questions uh, in in this uh, amazing episode, but um, one that still sticks out is I, I would love to ask Ben Burt and his and his team what other sound designers or sound design examples they really admire. Mm. You know, there's something there's something wonderful about asking asking an expert um, who who you love uh, what what other experts they love. Um, and sometimes you get sometimes you get really challenging answers, but um, yeah, I'd I'd love to know like what who are the sound designers or the sound design moments that um, he and his team um, really love. That's a good question. Uh, I always like knowing that too. Have have him on as a guest, and we can find out. Right. Um, no big deal. Hey, if anyone, <laughs> any listeners can hook me up. Who's got um, to hook up? Yeah. Somebody. Um, Question number three, what is a score or soundtrack that you're fond of besides anything Star Wars? I'm really shocked this answer hasn't come up yet from other folks or maybe come up on an app I haven't heard yet. Um, but the the soundtrack to Akira by uh, Geno Yamashiro Gumi is, it's it's a constant revelation. I feel like I'm constantly learning new things from it. It's, it's a, a score that um, totally stands out on its own. Um, and it works as a kind of symphonic piece in a way, um, but it also totally fits by going in by like taking the the, the text and for the the musical subtext like running in the total opposite direction um, uh, in terms of like cultural touch points. Um, you know, it's it's not even it's a, it's not even Japanese music. It's it's primarily influenced by gamelan or or the Japanese elements are are no elements. Um, 
uh, you know, so for a, a, an animated Japanese music mo- movie about the future, it's very rooted in the distant past and largely composed of non-Japanese um, sound types or music music types. Um, and it's just it's beautiful and complex on its own. I'm surprised no I, one I've, has said that too. There's definitely some runner ups for this too. I, I thought about like, oh, can I? If you could give a run. I have a different answer from from score versus soundtrack, but um, but that one's that one really oh. stands out. Wait, what do you mean by score? Ver- um, like, I I wonder whether I should instead say oh, oh. harder they the harder they come by Jimmy Cliff, like that. It's actually you know, Jimmy familiar. Cliff. It's also also Toots in the Maytale. It's a um 1970s um movie with this this original um or mostly original reggae soundtrack, and it's it's. All these th- songs are fantastic, you know, Toots and the Maytals and Jimmy Cliff songs on their own. Um, but it, it has the rare, the rare combination of original songs or largely original songs for a movie that thematically or symbolically tell the story of that film. And if you listen to the Oh, album, you just mean because it, it's, oh yeah. Well, that's why I say score or soundtrack. Okay. Someone okay. can say high fidel or, you know, someone can say Pulp Fiction if they want or... American graffiti or something, which doesn't have an original score. It has, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I yeah. have to give points to, to Cliff for, you know, also composing new songs. You know, it's a, there's a, definitely an art to arranging songs that have other contexts and fitting them in like Pulp Fiction does. Um, but there's also something cool, you know, uh, extra difficulty level of, of coming up with new stuff that also works as a totally independent pop song. Yeah, it's a whole... It's, it, it's a whole different way to build to build the sound of a film. Um, and sometimes, I mean, a lot of the time, films will have both score and pl- uh, music placement, like mm-hmm. source music. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Thank you very much. Um, the themes, there were no, th- there are no light motifs <laughs> in this set of minutes. But on the soundtrack, that little tiny bit that you hear is, can be found on the, at the very beginning of the track called The Battle of Yevon. Um, it also has a ridiculously long title on I, on at least one of the soundtrack editions that's I'm, I'm not even joking it's the battle of yavin parentheses launch from the fourth moon slash x wings draw fire slash use the force is the name of the track <laughs> so yeah okay. hard to miss hard to confuse that with something else <laughs> <laughs> um alex where can people find you online if you want to uh, be found yeah online? yeah that's that's fine probably the, the best way um is on Instagram. Um, if you're if you're really interested in some uh, some some nerd and dog content, um, <laughs> I, I I am at a uh, a pun I have to explain out loud as well as spell uh, on Instagram. Uh, it's a uh, 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 moi underscore Thai underscore fighter, um, which is me thinking that it's uh, funny that a, a Thai fighter is a cool Star Wars thing. And also Muay Thai is my preferred martial art. Oh uh, my gosh, that's and, funny. Uh, <laughs> and so I was I'm like, how is Moy, that a pun? But oh M- God. M- <laughs> M-U-A-Y underscore T-I-E underscore F-I-G-H-T-E-R. Uh, that's that. Find, oh. me, find me on Instagram. Uh, I'll probably be talking about my dog anyway. That one, I was. <laughs> you had to explain it before I got it. Can you believe it wasn't taken? Kind of not, actually. <laughs> um, wow. All right. Well, everyone, you can find Star Wars Music Minute on all the social media platforms in the world. Uh, not missing any of them. Damn it. I've already made that joke. It's not a good joke. I'm not bad at this. <laughs> I'm, I'm not good at this. Um, all right. So, with that, I think I'm just going to wrap it up. Oh, you know what? I'm going to say there are only. Three episodes left. No, four episodes left of A New Hope. It's 21, 20, four episodes left for A New Hope season. Now, if you have any last minute questions about the music or sound in A New Hope, by the time this is released, I probably will not have yet recorded the last episode, which will be just a solo episode where I am... Uh, maybe doing like a wrap up of like common themes that popped up throughout all the episodes and also answering questions that I didn't get to. Um, So this is just your last call for like, if you want to add um, any more questions or any, any comments um, for me to either read or play on the show, um, you can 
write me a comment or something like that at podcast at star wars music minute.com or um in the comments of wherever you're listening to this or on twitter or whatnot you can also leave a voice comment uh at the com link at star wars music minute.com slash com link um and you can also um tell me or you can tell me on discord if you're my patron alex is alex is a patron uh, my patrons have access to my Discord server, so that's probably the fastest way to contact me <laughs> uh, because social media is... There's too many ads on there. It's like overwhelming to to view social media. For, you know what I mean? Uh, but anyway, yeah, the questions episode, um, that will be hopefully a, a big one. Uh, and with that, I'm going to sign off now. Thank you Thank so much you so for listening. Much, uh, this has been an absolute pleasure and an honor to be a part of this amazing project that you're working on. And uh, of course, much respect to Alex Robinson and uh, and the, the boys over at Star Wars Minute for uh, kicking this off so many years ago. Absolutely. All right. See you next week on Star Wars Music Minute.